Hi, welcome to another fireside chat given by our 150th anniversary committee. It's glad, I'm glad to be with you. My name is Frank Adler and I'm talking briefly about the history and significance of Arthur Weatherly's first ministry from 1908 to 1919. Uh, I'll speak at a later time on his second ministry from 1929 to 1942. After serving the South Unitarian Memorial Church for eight years in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, Arthur and Clara came to Lincoln in September of 1908 to begin a ministry at All Souls Unitarian Church. Born in Simcoe, Ontario, Canada, in 1868, Weatherly came to the United States when he was two years old and settled in Iowa. His father, a tailor, and his mother were both born in England. Arthur and Clara Alyn Jones were married after they both graduated from Grinnell College. Uh, Arthur went on to Harvard Divinity School. Here's a photo of Weatherly that was used most often in Lincoln papers. He was lucky to flourish during the progressive era from the late 1800s to 1918 at a time when his passion for democracy and social justice found many echoes in Lincoln and across the nation. This was not so during and after World War I. Almost as soon as he arrived, he established the Initiative and Referendum League, whereby legislative and popular measures could be added to the ballot. He worked tirelessly to lay the legislative groundwork for workmen's compensation. Indeed, he's known in Nebraska as the father of workmen's compensation. As secretary of the Lincoln Hospital Association, established in 1910, Weatherly shepherded the organization of a city hospital until he left in 1919. He returned to Lincoln from Iowa City to lay the cornerstone of the city hospital in 1923. He saw religion and democracy not just joined at the hip, but even more intimately connected. In fact, he saw democracy as the social expression of the religious affirmation of the worth and value of the individual soul. He had a deep affinity for the working class, and he loved to play pool. <laughs> he also loved philosophical discussions. He once said that a liberal church needed to satisfy three functions. One, it must contribute something to the enrichment of the lives of its members, children and adults. Two, it must loyally stand by the principle of a free pulpit, meaning that the minister must be a man, not a puppet. And three, it must encourage its members to identify themselves by thought or deed and whenever possible by both with movements of the communal life. The movements in communal life that most deeply interested him in his first ministry were women's suffrage and the prevention of war. In 1909, he was already on the legislative committee of the Nebraska Woman Suffrage Association, along with other Unitarians, such as Professor Leon Aylesworth, A.J. Sawyer, Dr. Inez Philbrick, and Walter Locke. In 1911, he asked the Suffrage Association to extend membership to men and also invite socialist and labor union members to join. Three years later, Dr. Anna Howard Shaw, president of the National Woman Suffrage Association, came to Lincoln, uh, to Nebraska, for two weeks to conduct an equal suffrage campaign by barnstorming towns in automobiles. Weatherly and his group covered 16 cities in the two-week period. The headline of one story in the Lincoln Daily News stated, quote, Weatherly tears holes in Omaha men's manifesto, unquote. <laughs> 
This is the 1914 photo showing Weatherly standing in the automobile used for the suffrage campaign. When the Nebraska Senate Committee heard arguments in February of 1917 for and against the limited suffrage bill, Weatherly was the last speaker and stoutly defended passage of the bill. Later that year in August, Weatherly, while summering in Maine, gave two weeks of his time to the Maine suffrage campaign. The Bangor Daily News reported that he, quote, gave a stirring address on equal suffrage from his auto in front of the D.A. Curtis and Company's drugstore on Main Street, unquote. His other great passion was the promotion of international peace. There's no doubt that he was a principal pacifist, as were two other important Unitarian ministers, both good friends with Weatherly, namely Jenkin Lloyd Jones of Chicago and John Haynes Holmes of New York. Holmes expressed his view of the relationship between war and religion in his 1916 book, New Wars for Old, in the following way, quote, Where religion is, there can be no war. Where war is, there can be no religion, unquote. In November of 1911, Weatherly sent a letter to the Omaha Daily Bee, signed by 15 noted Nebraskans, including William Jennings Bryan, asking for anyone interested in forming a Nebraska branch of the American Peace Society to send their names to him. Nearly half of the 15 noted Nebraskans were Unitarians. The first meeting of the Nebraska Peace Society was held on February 5, 1912 at St. Paul's Methodist Church in Lincoln. It was the third branch of the American Peace Society to be established in the Midwest. William Jennings Bryan was elected honorary president. George Eliot Howard, nationally known professor of history and chair of the Nebraska University Department of Political Science and Sociology, was elected president and Weatherly was elected secretary treasurer. Although the American Peace Society may have been chosen for its acceptability in Nebraska, Weatherly chafed at its sedate procedures. The extent of its activism amounted to discussing resolutions and sending them to the president and congressional representatives. Weatherly hoped to shape the Nebraska Peace Society into a more activist organization. By 1915, C.A. Sorensen, a law student at the University of Nebraska, had joined the Nebraska Peace Society and was assistant secretary to Weatherly. As a Unitarian, Sorensen was also a principal pacifist. When President Wilson dithered and refused to take a leading role or even participate in organizing neutral countries in an attempt to bring about some form of mediation between belligerent nations, Henry Ford decided to use his own money to establish an unofficial mediation committee in Stockholm. Using the resolutions passed by the first International Congress of Women for Peace at The Hague in April of 1915, Ford uh, organized peace delegates, journalists, and students on board two ships to cross the Atlantic Ocean to visit the neutral countries of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Holland. This publicity was used to drum up support for promoting mediation. At first, the Ford expedition was praised by the press, but as Wilson began to take a strong position on preparedness, the, war, the pro-war press ridiculed Ford's efforts mercilessly. Nevertheless, the expedition was able to establish a mediation committee with delegates from all neutral nations. The committee, however, was unable to bring the belligerent nations to the table. Here's a drawing of Weatherly that originally appeared in a Swedish paper that shows him holding forth before a Swedish audience in Stockholm. Prior to the de declaration of war on April 6, 1917, the Midwest had been divided about whether to go to war. 
The faculty at the University of Nebraska was split between pro and anti-war factions, with each faction sending in petitions to Wilson and congressional leaders. After war was declared, a wave of repression and anti-German sentiment, the likes of which the nation had never seen, swept the country. With the passage of the Espionage and Sedition Acts, freedom of speech was eliminated. People were arrested simply for criticizing the government. If Weatherly thought that the Unitarian Church could become a pacifist church, he was wrong. When the General Conference of Unitarian and Other Christian Churches met in Montreal in September of 1917, headed by ex-president William Howard Taft, the conference voted 236 to 9 that Unitarians should fully support the war and not allow for any dissension, thus giving full support to repressive measures of the Wilson administration. As a pacifist, <clears throat> Weatherly was considered by many to be a traitor. Some members of his congregation refused to pay his salary. By the beginning of 1918, however, the church rallied behind him and found a solution. The church would pay his full salary if he worked for the War Camp Community Service, an early version of the USO, uh, USO in, in Southport, North Carolina. He left Lincoln for Southport before Super Patriots could stop him. However, the Nebraska State Council of Defense that put 11 professors and one staff member at the University of Nebraska on trial for disloyalty sent a report to Washington that Weatherly was unfit to serve. He was recalled from Southport to Washington for questioning, but he telegrammed friends in Lincoln who immediately sent letters to Washington on his behalf. After his successful tour of duty in Southport, he was promoted to organize the War Camp Community Service in Norfolk, Virginia. Arthur, Clara, and their son Jack returned to Lincoln after the armistice in late December of 1918. The mistreatment of African Americans in the South made a deep impression on Weatherly and brought about a shift in his priorities. From his emphasis on pacifism and women's suffrage before the war to his emphasis on racial justice uh, and ending white supremacy after the war. He began giving talks in Lincoln entitled, quote, personal observations of the Negro problem, unquote. According to the Lincoln Star, he stated that the Negro problem was, quote, the greatest problem confronting the nation today, unquote. He invited W.E.B. Du Bois, editor of the NAACP's journal Crisis, to give a talk at the church critical of the Army's treatment of black soldiers. He gave talks at the Lincoln chapter of the NAACP. The Lincoln chapter had been established in 1918 by African Americans Clyde Malone and Trago McWilliams. After the death of Weatherly's friend, Jenkin Lloyd Jones, in 1918, John Morris Evans, minister of the First Unitarian Church of Dayton, Ohio, accepted the call to be Lloyd's successor in Chicago. In September of 1919, Weatherly accepted a call to go to the church in Dayton to succeed Evans. The entire story of why he left Lincoln is still unclear to me. One thing, however, is clear. He left very reluctantly because Lincoln was near and dear to his heart. Another thing is clear, too. After leaving Lincoln, he will continue to fight against racial injustice and white supremacy. Indeed, the cornerstone of his second ministry will be to help establish an African-American community center as a home for black self-expression in Lincoln. Thank you.